Hello and welcome to module 5.9. This is the culmination of the AGPS part of the course, module 5. And we've, we've looked at integration, uh, assisted GPS, coherent integration, the limits thereof, non-coherent integration. Now, finally, we're ready to put this all together and look at a spreadsheet that ties everything from the front end analysis through the coherent integration to the non-coherent integration basically shows you how you go about designing a high sensitivity receiver. And such receivers didn't even exist more than about 12 years ago. So this is showing you something that's, that's really fairly new, considering that GPS itself has been around for over 30 years. So just uh, to remind you of where we were in the last video, we were looking at I and Q. So there was I samples and Q samples, and then when the phase changed, so that coherent integration became limited in the length of time that you could do it, we did this operation of squaring, adding, and then take the square root, and then summing, and all of that together, all of this is the non-coherent integration, which makes us immune to these phase changes here and allows us to get the correlation peak that we're looking for. So what we're going to look at now is well, this thing called squaring loss and actually how you quantify it. And once we've done that, we can go to our spreadsheets and actually work out receiver designs. So this was the curve for the squaring loss, and I showed you this in the last video. Um, the, uh, the axes here are the coherent SNR before squaring, so in dBs, you'll have some coherent SNR. And given that you had one particular coherent SNR, this shows you what your squaring loss is after the squaring operation. So now we're going to quantify this. So you, we begin doing that by applying a variable name gamma to coherent SNR, just so that we don't have to keep writing coherent SNR. And then also defining something alpha as the square root of 2 gamma. That just makes the equations a little bit simpler, so that we're not carrying around square roots of 2 everywhere. And then it turns out, uh, for reasons explained in the book, but that we can't go into now, that as long as the coherent SNR is less than 1.5 dB, which is that red line there, so for all coherent SNRs in this range, the equation that describes the squaring loss is given by this. So it's just a polynomial equation. It's, it's not the kind of thing you have to remember. You look it up in a book and you can, you can code it into a spreadsheet or into a script. And it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's just a, a polynomial that, that will return for you that line uh, on the curve over that range. And then if the coherent SNR was greater than 1.5 dB, so anywhere in this range, right here, then the equation you use is just that, a different polynomial to account for the different shape of the curve there. And so it's as simple as that. As I mentioned, the details of how we get those equations are, are quite complex, and we won't go into that now. But those are the results you need for, for actually doing the work and, and working on high sensitivity receiver design. So let's jump right to that. And we'll bring up the spreadsheet that we've seen before. Uh, but I want to point out one difference. So here we've got minus 160 dBm. So we started with minus 130 dBm, approximately the nominal uh, outdoor signal strength. And we, we, the very first time we saw the spreadsheet, we, we had that number in there. Uh, now we're looking at a, a much weaker signal because we, we're trying to see how can we design a high sensitivity receiver. And for the coherent interval, I've chosen a value here of 40 milliseconds, which is quite long. It, it would require us to have some kind of uh, data wipe off. You remember data wipe off? We have the data bits every 20 milliseconds. So to get a coherent interval even anything longer than 20 milliseconds requires you would have to know the data bits. So I'm assuming you know that. So this is already beyond the level of integration we've seen before. And yet, look what happens when you go through the spreadsheet. I'm not going to go through line by line. We've done that already in the previous video. But just look at the result. The coherent SNR is minus 2.9 dB, almost minus 3 dB. What does that mean? It means the, the power in the signal is about half the power in the noise. You wouldn't see it at all. So 
your receiver would not see that you would not acquire the signal at minus 160 dBm. So, so it means your receiver is not working. You've, you've missed that signal. You, you don't acquire the satellite. So that's wh where. So what do you do? Well, you you would say, well, maybe I could increase this coherent integration time. But we know you can't do that very much more than a few tens of milliseconds because of the the issues of residual frequency error and how long coherent integration tends to hurt you after a while rather than help you. And so we're going to add to the spreadsheet this part that does the math for the non-coherent integration. And and we'll see how it works out. So be, because we've these numbers are quite small now, what I'm going to do is is cut this spreadsheet right here at the end of the coherent integration, which is something we've we've studied before, and then put that up at the top. So we start with the the coherent SNR of minus 2.9 dB and say, OK, now we're going to do non-coherent integration from here, and how's it going to work out? So let's go line by line. So the squaring loss, we apply the formula I just showed you, and that returns a value of minus 3.8 dB. So what does that mean? That means after squaring, we're now at minus 6 point something dB. So things are worse, just like I showed you in the previous video after the, in that MATLAB simulation. After squaring, things get a bit worse, but we have now given ourselves the opportunity to continue integrating non-coherently. And so we have to pick some non-coherent integration time. So this is, this is a value in our control. We can choose how long to do non-coherent integration. And that's what system design in GPS is. If you do this for a living, you have to choose these values. And you might very well work with a spreadsheet like this. And so I've chosen a value here of 10 seconds, 10,000 milliseconds. And we'll see that that works out. And it raises the question, well, how did I know to choose that value? And I'll show you that at the very end of this video. How do we find out which values to choose? And there's some nice features uh, in Excel uh, worksheets that that really quite useful for doing this. And I'll show you that at the end. But now let's just assume that we we just guessed at 10 seconds of total non-coherent integration time and see how it works out. So remember the coherent gain was a function of how many non-coherent intervals we have, this m sub nc. So we have to work that out. So each coherent interval is 40 milliseconds. Each coherent interval, that's 40 milliseconds. Remember that? and so the total time of 10,000 milliseconds divided by 40, that's where we get this 250 from. So we have 250 of these non-coherent integrations. And so the non-coherent gain is going to be 250. If we convert that to dBs, we get 24 dBs. And now we can add everything up. So, and now you can see how we're going to win, because we were at minus 3 about. And then we had a further minus 3, a little bit more, minus 3.8 of loss from squaring. So that was about minus 6. But now we've got this big, strong gain of 24 dB. And so we add everything up. And voila, we've got a good positive number, 17 dB, final SNR. And so remember, that's the dB value of the height of the peak above the median noise divided by the variance of the noise, or divided by the standard deviation of the noise, all squared. And if we convert that back to ratio, we get this number 7.3, which would mean the peak is at 7.3 times the standard deviation of the noise. It would stand out nice and clear, just like in the figures we've looked at, and we'd see it. And, and so you would have created a receiver that with 10 seconds of non-coherent integration would acquire or track a signal at minus 160 dBm, which is a, a very weak GPS signal. That's a 1,000 times weaker than an outdoor GPS signal. And that's the kind of signal strength that you get when you're indoors. So if you're going to make GPS work indoors, you need this kind of integration and these kind of numbers uh, in, in your programming of your receiver. So now you might remember, if you think back or you go look back at those earlier videos where we just looked at standard GPS, we didn't demand anything like a 7 ratio. Think what this is. This is 7 sigma. We're saying we've got a, the peak, the distance from the peak to the median over the sigma is 7 times. And previously, we, we, uh, when we looked at standard GPS spreadsheet and we started with a signal of minus 130, 
we let the value go to three and we said that's good enough, three sigma. So why are we demanding such a high value now? Why didn't I just choose a value that stopped at three? So that's, that's a question that's worth digging into. Why do we need such a, why am I asking us to have such a high value like something above six sigma? And the reason for that is, let's, let's go back to this, ra this car radio analogy, you remember this one where the receiver's scanning uh, over all the different code delays and frequencies and looking for energy and then it found it and you remember the analogy I said it's like tuning a, a radio in in a car and you suddenly hear a radio station welcome to KGPS and that that's your brain doing in my analogy the equivalent of the receiver finding this peak well well what if we said like we said early on that the threshold to declare a peak is just three times the standard deviation of the noise. Well, that actually is the way things were in receivers before people started building high sensitivity receivers. And, and what happens then is if, if we start this little video again, you would just go a certain distance and, and before very long, you would have a noise sample that exceeded three sigma of the, the the standard deviation of the noise. And why is that? It's because the noise has over 2,000 chances to beat you. Imagine the noise is throwing a dice and it gets 2,000 throws the dice. And, and so let's just talk where does that 2,044 number comes from. Well, the PR encode has 1,023 chips and we sample at two chips, two samples per chip, so that's 2,046. And of all those samples, only two of them are going to fall in the correlation peak. This little line here is the triangle that we're looking for. It doesn't look like a triangle because it's, it's so narrow. But there's just two samples that actually fall in the triangle. So, so the number of noise samples, so noise samples are 2046 minus two. There's only two samples actually on the peak. And there's our 2044. So there are 2,044 noise samples and two signal samples in one frequency bin when we actually hit the signal. And when, we, when we're in a bin where the signal doesn't exist, then it's 2,046. One way or the other, the noise has over 2,000 chances to beat you. Now, how likely is it that the noise would hit three sigma? Well, if you look at a Gaussian distribution, about three of every thousand samples exceeds three sigma. You, you might remember the, uh, in a Gaussian distribution, the number 99.7 uh, is associated with three sigma. 99.7 of a sample set is less than three sigma of the, the this is where sigma is the standard deviation of these random variables. So in 2000 noise samples, you'd expect something like six to be above three sigma. So if, if we did our little radio analogy where this receiver starts up and starts looking for energy, it would hear it all the time. Every, every few thousand or every, every few hundred, it would have hit the threshold of three. And that's indeed what happened in traditional receivers. And then what they would do is try to decode data. And if they can't decode data, they know that they're just tracking noise. So the analogy with the radio station is you tune your car radio and you hear the slightest thing and you stop there and you listen. And then you realize, oh, it's not really a radio station. And you carry on and you, and you, hear, you hear something. Oh, is that a radio station? No, you keep listening until you get it. Now, so why do we care so much? Why don't we just do that now? Well, with assisted GPS, we don't have to bother decoding the data from the satellite because we get the data from the network. And so with assisted GPS, when we find the signal, instead of listening to welcome to KGPS and, and actually getting the data from the satellite, we hear something like you imagine you just heard welcome and stop. You just get the PRN code, you get the, from knowing the PRN delay, you know the distance to the satellite and an assisted GPS receiver can stop right there and compute your position for you by using the data that, go, that it got from the network. So because of that, it's much more susceptible to a false correlation peak because it wouldn't ever find out that it was false because it wouldn't wait until it had decoded the data. And think about the practical implications of this. You can, you can see some of these peaks. Look, there's one right there. That's more than three standard deviations of the noise. Suppose you, you thought that that was your peak and you said, oh, look, I found the peak. 
There's my tau. It's 1020. So that's the pseudo range you think you got, but the true pseudo range is really here. So what is this in, in actual normal units? In typical distance units, this whole thing is one millisecond of light speed, which is 300 kilometers. And so this distance here, where we, the peak really is, is something like about 80 kilometers. So if you mistook that peak for an actual peak and you provided that pseudo range to the nav code, you would make an error of hundreds of kilometers. And what I like to say is nobody ever forgets an error of 300 kilometers. So it's something you don't ever want to do when you're designing a GPS receiver. And so this is an example of a hard threshold, this, this threshold of deciding how high the signal has to get before you accept it as a correlation peak in an assisted GPS receiver is something that you can't mess with because if you make a mistake, you're going to have errors of hundreds of kilometers. So you'll remember earlier we talked about a soft threshold, was, which was when we designed the frequency bins and we decided how much speed we would design for in the car, for a typical application, for example, a car, and we chose 160 kilometers per hour as the, the limit of how much we'd allow for the speed of the car. And then we showed that that was a soft threshold in that if somebody was going faster than 100 kilometers per hour, it really wouldn't matter because there were a lot of other thresholds that added onto that, and all of them would have to max out at the same time before the receiver would fail. And even then, it would only fail in the direction of the motion uh, of the receiver for that particular satellite, and there's other satellites it would acquire. That was a soft threshold. This, and at that video, if you go back and look at it, I promised you I'd show you a hard threshold. This is the hard threshold. This value of you need to get a peak of something like six sigma if you're going to make use of that peak for a pseudo range without going through the process of decoding data to be sure you really were on the signal. So that's, that's a very important little detail that comes about from the spreadsheet. And to finish this video, we're going to go to the spreadsheet itself, not just an image of the spreadsheet, but the actual spreadsheet, so I can show you some of the tools available to you for deciding how long the non-coherent interval has to be to be able to generate a signal that sticks up above six sigma. So now we have an actual spreadsheet up on the screen. Uh, instead of just a picture of the, the spreadsheet. And the, the point of this is to show you how we go about using uh, an Excel spreadsheet to actually decide on these values, like the 10 seconds of non-coherent integration. We just saw that that gave us a, a final SNR of 7, which is great. But how did we get that number of 10? And you, you, could ex you could just guess numbers and try it, but there's a more efficient way. So, let's, so here's the spreadsheet. At the top, we had the minus 160 dBm, and there was the 40 milliseconds of coherent interval, and you remember that, that after coherent integration, the coherent SNR came out at about minus 3 dB, minus 2.9 dB, not nearly enough to see the signal. We needed to do coherent integration, and so here I'm showing you, well, what if we picked one second as our coherent integration time? Well, the final SNR ratio comes out at 2.3. So it's certainly better than minus 2.9, but it's still not nearly big enough to reach a threshold of a number like 6 sigma. So how do we decide how big the coherent interval has to be to make the SNR ratio big enough? Well, this is how. You go click on the SNR ratio, as you see there, and then go to Tools, Goal Seek, and we say change that final SNR ratio to our target value. Well, we want it to be bigger than 6, so let's choose 7. By changing what? Well, what can we change? There's two things we can change, and I've, I've made them, I've put gray boxes around them. We can change a coherent interval, but we can't make that any bigger than it is now for the reasons we've discussed previously. And we can change the non-coherent interval, and that's what we're going to change. So we click on that. And so now Excel has been, is going to run this built-in program to say, change the SNR ratio to 7 by changing this value, which is the non-coherent ratio. And this, is our, this goal seek is a built-in function of Excel. So I just click OK, and Voila, it, comes, it tells us that if we chose 9.308 seconds of non-coherent in integration time, we'd get an SNR ratio of exactly 7. OK, now realize that you, you can't choose 9.308 because you've got to choose some multiple of 40 because the coherent interval is every 40 milliseconds it's spitting out a result for you. And so you'd round that up and, and that's, why, that's how we came up with a number like 10. We say, well, we round 9.3 seconds. Let's round it up to 10. So 
So now we can say thank you, Excel, for your help. And we know that 9.3 works. We try 10,000 milliseconds, and there's our value back again, 7.3. And that's how you do it.